All right, we're going to pick it up on uh, the handout from last week. And I don't know how many weeks I've been in this chapter, but a lot. <laughs> we have the handout for the second half ready, the second half of the chapter. We might need it, probably will, actually, as I look at the time. But I didn't want to give it out just yet in case we didn't. But I want to just give a picture of, and we're on page 16 of the handout that you have from, that we've been, so we're Daniel chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. And let me just tell you about, um, we're going to do something in here that I've never, never, just never seen anybody else do, but we're going to do it because I know that you are people who like want to learn. You're like, give me content that has spiritual value. And so, and that drives me. That like really motivates me. And so like some of you, a number of you got Bibles after last week. It really motivates me when I, when I see people who want to learn. So interesting thing. Okay. The Apocrypha does not belong in the Bible. I'll just be real clear on that. It does not belong in the Bible. Um, after we do the next handout, probably take a couple weeks on that. There are two significant things that are in the Apocrypha that are added to Daniel chapter 3. So they're actually really interesting. That does not mean they belong in the Bible. But they're basically a song and a prayer. Okay, let me, let me explain it like this. Because we're going to take a, we'll take one of our meetings and talk about that stuff, that part. It's in the Septuagint. But let me say it like this. If you could pick your favorite song that you've sung your entire Christian walk, other than one that's right out of the Bible, any song, any song that is not right out of the Bible, you could probably put a name on one just for illustration purpose. Does that song belong in the Bible? If you think it does, you got to straighten out your thinking. <laughs> it does not belong in the Bible. See the point? But that does not mean that song does not have immense spiritual life-giving property. Right? That's the way these two editions are to what's in Daniel chapter 3. And Protestants have just not had the opportunity to even look at it. What is it? What's in there? And we'll take a session and we'll talk about that. And I'll explain why it doesn't belong in the Bible. But that'd be like me saying, you know, you know, oh, the blood of Jesus doesn't belong in the Bible. Okay. Doesn't belong in the Bible. I can't tell you how many thousands of times I've sung that song and will. <laughs> So I, I know you're going to be blessed by that because you're people who like to study the Bible and content, and get the context, and the meaning, and what does it mean for me, and you're going to get blessed. But we're going to finish Daniel chapter 3 first. So on, on page 16, and I'm not going to read the whole chapter today, uh, we're going to start right here with verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you're ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good! But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. So the king is in rage and fury. 
as the TLV says, he's furious with rage because the king sees this as a personal affront. He's like, they're attacking me. And he's not very used to that. He's king. You know, he's a guy who has no problems and has countless times just thrown people into a burning fiery furnace. You know, he's like just destroys things at whim. So is it true? Now, these three guys have probably been in office for years by now. And so the king says, I'm going to give him a second chance. I'm going to give him a chance to repent. After all, he is aware of the jealousy of the Chaldeans. He remembers that Daniel and his three friends were the ones who were able to give him the dream and the meaning of the dream once in Daniel chapter 2. So in his mind, this golden statue is actually a fulfillment of the dream and the interpretation. Hey, you guys ought to be happy. This statue exists because of the dream that you told me about. So he's giving them an opportunity. The American Standard Version says, translates it, is it of purpose? Do you realize what you're doing? Like, do you even know? Are you clueless? And so the, they, the, the king asks them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? You do not serve my gods, worship my golden image? And once again, what we see here is the religious and the political aspects of the kingdom are connected in Babylon. We've seen that a few times. We're going to see it here now. Coincidentally, in Revelation chapter 17, we have religious Babylon of the last days. And in Revelation chapter 18, we have political or economic Babylon of the last days. So an overview, just a quick overview of Revelation chapter 17. In verse 5, it says, On her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. So who is this harlot? Who is this prostitute? One thing we know is that it is not a government. How do we know that? Go over to the next page. That's verse 5. Here's how the chapter opens. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked to me, saying, Come and I'll show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Revelation 17, so, so clearly this harlot is somebody who's doing something with the governments. So it's not the governments. So it's not a political entity in Revelation chapter 17. Revelation 17, 9 tells us where this prostitute lives. It says, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Well, Rome was and is known as a city that sits on seven hills. And no one who read the book of Revelation in the first century would have missed that as an allusion to the city of Rome. Furthermore, remember, the church is part of the bride of Christ. I don't like to say it is the bride of Christ because um, Israel is the bride of Christ. And the church is the bride of Christ because she is grafted onto Israel. So that's why I put my words carefully there. Okay? So Revelation 17 is a picture of the person who should be the bride of Christ. But she will prostitute herself with the kings of the world. That's why it's a prostitute, a harlot. So probably one of the first things that we might wonder, is Revelation 17 a diatribe against the Roman Catholic Church, the Church of Rome? And there's a lot of people who taught that for a lot of years. But I do not believe that. Why not? Let's assume for the time being that this is referring to the church that is headquartered in Rome, the church. Given that assumption, whenever the rapture happens, Every saved Christian in the Roman church is suddenly going to be snatched out of it. And what will be left will be an organization in the city of Rome that is going to have a lot of people, a lot of wealth, a lot of power. And that organization could conspire with the Antichrist. Instead of being the bride at that point, it would be a prostitute. But it would be wrong to make this a diatribe against the Catholic Church. Why? Because when the rapture happens, every 
Bible-believing, Jesus-loving, Yeshua-committed person in the Protestant world is also going to be taken. And at that point, that church will be left here with a lot of power and a lot of wealth and a lot of people. So it's really rather selfish and short-sighted to make it only about the Roman church when it's probably about all of the church after that moment happens, when all believers are removed. So that, does it, that, that makes a whole lot more sense to me. So Revelation chapter 17 is a religious Babylon. Revelation 18 is a political or an economic Babylon. So here's an overview of that. In Revelation chapter 18, verse 1, an angel comes down from heaven. And in verse 2, he cries mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon, the great, is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine and the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys her merchandise anymore, merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones, pearls, fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet, and every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of the most precious wood, bronze, iron and marble and cinnamon, and incense, fragrant oil, and frankincense, wine, and oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, and sheep, horses, and chariots, and then, I hope this catches you, and bodies and souls of men. That is describing a world that is really dealing with human slavery human trafficking. Today there are something like, I looked this up, 50 million slaves now. The history, there are more people who are slaves now probably than the rest of history combined. Right now the world we live in has got a problem with slavery. Think about Jeffrey Epstein. Think about Sean Diddy, Puff Diddy, and that's just two famous names. And how many of the famous people of the world have run with those two characters? And that's just two. And that's the ones that made it to the news in America. And many of them would never even make it to the news in another country. It would be a non-issue. So this is the condition of the world in the last days. So Revelation chapter 17 is a religious Babylon. Revelation chapter 18 is a political and an economic Babylon. And Daniel chapter 3 verse 14, it's showing the precursor to the last days melding of religion and religious and political Babylon together. They're coming together. So on page 19, Nebuchadnezzar's response to the three young Jewish men. Did I see here a question? 20. Oh, okay. I don't know what happened there. Okay. I don't know. 19? I'm going to 19. Nebuchadnezzar's response, whatever, whatever page that's on. <laughs> Thank you. To the three young Jewish men. Now, if you're ready, at the time you hear the sound of the horn and the flute. And then he says, and who is this God who will deliver you from my hands? Nebuchadnezzar is aware that the God of the Jews is superior over the other Babylonian gods. He saw their amazing ability when the dream was given and explained. He couldn't have completely forgotten it. So the king may actually effectively be saying, not even your God is going to be able to do this. Will he? That might be what he's saying. Maybe he isn't blaspheming. He could be showing some honest skepticism. Last time he was skeptical with Daniel when he asked him, are you really going to be able to tell me the dream and interpret it? And he didn't punish Nebuchadnezzar for questioning Daniel's, or God didn't punish Nebuchadnezzar 
for questioning Daniel's ability to do the impossible with the help of Daniel's God. And consequently, Nebuchadnezzar was actually given the revelation. And when Daniel gave him the revelation, what Daniel actually says to him is, as for me, the secret was not revealed to me, but so that you may know the thoughts of your heart. So it may be that he's not blaspheming. On the other hand, Nebuchadnezzar does think that his power is supreme. And he does believe that he is the head of gold. And he's not going to put up with insubordination. So even though he may have some honest skepticism, in the end, he is actually challenging God. Who is this God who's going to deliver you from my hand? And they say to him, hey, we have no need to answer you. Now, that's a really bold statement to say. I mean, it's forthright, and frankly, it's even a little offensive. You know, most people, most of us probably, would do our best to go into a very long discourse here to lengthen the amount of time between now and when we are thrown into the oven. Because <laughs> that is going to happen. They know they're headed there, and we would be the same exact way. So, you know, we, we, would, we would just be afraid. By the way, as I looked at this, and, you know, like I, I, I do, I, I just can't, I, it's just, Donna will tell you, I just can't help but just, I'm always reading commentaries, and just, even though I put this together like a month or two ago, I'm still reading stuff. I came across something like a week ago, which I thought was really interesting. Rashi is quoting on Daniel 3.16. Rashi's like 11th century A.D., and he's quoting on Daniel 3.16, and he says this, why does Daniel 3.16 mention Nebuchadnezzar's name? Because it actually mentions his name. It says, it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. This is what Rashi, Rashi says. And this, is sound, this will sound a lot like something out of Matthew 22. If, he, they, he says, if it concerns taking upon ourselves to pay taxes, this is what he's saying that the Jews are saying, the three Jews. If it concerns taking upon ourselves to pay taxes, either the tax from the crops or the head taxes, you are king over us. But if it concerns denying the Holy One, blessed be he, you are merely Nebuchadnezzar. In our eyes, you are a lowly person, and the most despised of people. You are a dog. You and a dog are equal. That's what Rashi said these Jews are saying. But notice, if this is about taxes, yes. But if this is about who our God is, and what did the Lord say? He said, show me the coin. And they brought him the coin. And they said, whose image and inscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. And the Lord said, render therefore to the things to Caesar the things that are Caesar, and to God the things that are God's. Now, did Rashi get that from Yeshua? Because he's a thousand years after Yeshua. Or was this just so much a part of Jewish thinking already? But no matter what you do with it, you're stuck with this picture that Yeshua is extremely Jewish. So either Yeshua is reflecting the Jewishness a thousand years before Rashi says it, or he influenced Judaism. Either way. So in Daniel 3.17, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us. So obviously there's some expectation in these words. But there is no definite article before the word blazing furnace. In other words, they are not saying God can deliver us from the or this blazing furnace. The or this would be a definite article. Okay. In other words, they are saying God is able to deliver us from a, an indefinite article. A or any blazing furnace. And we will trust them to do so. That's what it actually says. But if not, you can know, king, we're not going to serve your gods. And here is a great lesson in faith. 
As we have seen, and I'm sure we'll see it again, and we'll live it, we cannot presume that God will necessarily deliver us from martyrdom. We just can't presume that. Faith expects, but faith does not presume. Sometimes it is not the purpose of God to deliver the faithful from martyrdom. There are stories of that in the book of Maccabees. I've, I've read them to you on Hanukkah services. The young men are saying, we're going to trust God to deliver us, but we are prepared to die for our God. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 10. Blessed is, are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when they revile and they persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So in Daniel 3.17, there is confidence. And in Daniel 3.18, there is humility. And it's not an easy balancing act, but these three Jews show us that it can be done. We could pass that handout out after all. Thank you. We're going we're gonna to have time. Yes. <laughs> Why wouldn't they bow down to the image? What was the issue? Well, the second commandment. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, even if it's really there. This is probably the strongest reason for rejecting the idea that the bread and the juice become the body and the blood of Jesus. They are made by human hands. They are powerful symbols, like oil is a powerful symbol of the Spirit. Jesus was in his own body when he said, this is my body broken for you. Nobody in the room, nobody in the room would have thought he meant that was him. They would have understood, 100% of the people in the room would have understood he was saying that this is my body means this is an illustration or a symbol of me. But it's not me. I'm here. Right? And so I like to say it like this sometimes. Is that because it says here, it says, it says, you shall not of anything that is in heaven above, on the earth beneath, or in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. In fact, in Exodus 34, 14, he says, My name is jealous. He said, You can call me that. Like the Yud Hey Vav Hey or the name Jesus. He said, you can just put the word jealous there just as well as it is my name. That's my name, jealous. If the second person in the Trinity himself showed up in this room right now, we would all kiss carpet. That's what we would do. The very fact that there is a difference between that wafer and that grape juice and the actual existence of his presence in the room is evidence that it is not actually him. And if it's not actually him, it begs idolatry. And you know, I, protect, I, I protected Catholicism a few moments ago, early in this, in this, but let me just say it this way. I do find it interesting that a denomination that does put statues in its places of worship would have a doctrine that the bread becomes the body. You see the point? I, for me, that's just kind of like, oh, okay. So I, I draw the line there as a Jew. Just, it's not. At the close of chapter two, Nebuchadnezzar added, I'm not down on the Catholics, you, you know, I'm almost always defending them. But in this case, no, they're, they're, it's, it's just, it's not the body and the blood. At the close of chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar added Daniel's God to his list of gods. You know, your God telling me my dream and interpreting it, wow. That was not hard for Nebuchadnezzar because Nebuchadnezzar is a polytheist. Even today, many Americans are essentially practically polytheists. We acknowledge God as one of the many things that we essentially worship. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are saying, we don't care how practical this is. We will not worship another god. We will not bow down to them. In Daniel chapter 4, the king who ordered them to bow down and worship him is himself going to be brought to the ground hum and to humble himself and to made to crawl like an animal. And you will see there is good reason to believe that Nebuchadnezzar actually gets saved 
in Daniel chapter 4. We'll see that when we get there. Do I have a copy of the handout? I don't even know if I do. I might. I don't. Can I have one? <laughs> Here, you can keep that. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. I should have put one in my notes. Any, any, before I move on, any, any questions, thoughts from the first half? Please. Oh, okay. So counting the Omer, the word Omer is the sheaf, and you shall count. So every day for 50 days, so you've got Passover, and then you go to the, so you go to the day after Passover, and then the day after that. Now in Judaism, Judaism follows the way the, the, the Pharisees did it. And so the, the church and Judaism count the days differently. That's why Pentecost Sunday falls on a different day than Shavuot most, most years. That's, that's literally the, the reason. The church followed the, the, um, the Sadducees method, and um, Judaism followed the Pharisees method. It's interesting that because that debate existed, the Sadducees were completely wiped out when the temple was destroyed. And what's so interesting about that was the church follows the Sadducees method, but the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. So, uh, but I will say this, I'm going to just come back right around. I think the church is right in the way to actually count the days. But Judaism, they're both legitimate. Judaism counts them like the Pharisees did. So, Basically, this is, so that's why Judaism and Christianity will have a different day for Pentecost Sunday versus, versus uh, um, Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. So the way it works, let me do it the church way first, and then I'll, do, then I'll explain the way it's on your paper, which is the way Judaism does it. The, ch the church way of doing it is you start out with Passover. It's the 14th day of the month. The 14th day of the month could be a Monday, could be a Tuesday, could be a Wednesday. Could be any day of the week, right? It's the 14th day of the month. You go to the first Sabbath that follows it. This is all in Leviticus chapter 23. I love Leviticus. So you go to the first Sabbath that follows Passover. Okay, so the Sadducees way of doing that and the church's way of doing that. It's kind of funny because the church is now blessing the Sabbath, the Saturday. That doesn't make any sense for them either. <laughs> okay. But you go to the first Sabbath that follows Passover, and then the day after that is Sunday. Right? And that happens to be Resurrection Sunday. And that is day one. And count 50 days. So you count seven weeks, which is 49 days, plus one day. You'll always end up on a Sunday, and that's how the church ends up with Pentecost always being on a Sunday. Okay, so the Bible actually says you shall count 50 days. That's a commandment. Okay, so now the Jewish way of doing it is the way um, the Pharisees did it. And in Exodus, it says, I think it's chapter 12, um, it, says, it says that what you do is the day, the day after after Passover, it says, you shall do no regular work. But then it says, only that which you must do to eat. Well, you know what? In Numbers 15 and in other places, number, or, um, in Exodus 16, they couldn't even uh, gather the manna on the Sabbath. So the Pharisees kind of, in this Jewish way, I just think it doesn't work, but it's what they do. Okay, so, so, so you go to the, so Passover falls on the 14th day. The day after Passover, do no regular work. And the Pharisees said, oh, no regular work. That's a, that's a Sabbath. No, it's not a Sabbath. It's do no regular work. It's not do no work. See the difference there? But if you make that a Sabbath, then Passover is the 14th day of the month. Okay, this year it'll be on a Monday. Then the day after that is Tuesday. And sunset on Tuesday, when the sun goes down, you would start the next day, and that would be the first day of the, of the um, 50 days. So the first day of the 50 days would start on Tuesday evening at sunset. Does that make sense? So those dates, Mel did a great job putting that together. Those dates on there 
um, if you just if you do that prayer at night after sunset, then the 23rd and each day you'll do it and you'll end up with that will take you to the Jewish day of the Feast of Shavuot because it's going off of the Jewish way of counting the Omer. An Omer is the word for sheaf, like a sheaf, uh, like a grain. And so for 50 days, a wave, a sheaf of grain was waved before the Lord. We just count the days. We can't count. We just count them because not even literally um, there is no temple. And so since there is no temple, the sheaves can't even be offered. And therefore, the Feast of Shavuot is largely sort of like it's either Judaism 101 or My Jewish Learning. One of those two websites will actually say that Shavuot is a feast day bereft of ritual. There's essentially nothing you really can do for this feast day because there is no temple. All right? So it's kind of a weird, weird thing. But it does say to count the days so we can count the days. Does that make sense? Good question. Anything else? It's a great time to ask questions about Passover or Shavuot, Pentecost. If not, we'll go right into it. Uh huh. Yeah. I can't do anything with it. The holiday bereft of tradition. All right, we're going to look at chapter three, beginning with verse nineteen, and um, the golden challenge. Then Nebuchadnezzar, full of fury and expression on his face, and the expression on his face changed toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in the army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. So his face changes. You can imagine an absolute totalitarian ruler is not used to having people say, hey, king, I don't even need to answer you. <laughs> He's not used to that. So he commands that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than it was usually heated. The temperature in these things is controlled by bellows that are forcing air into the chamber. So... It's a, uh, the idea of a seven-fold intensification is just basically pump more air into it, and it'll get hotter and hotter. But really, seven times harder is hyperbole because it's not possible to make that kind of a furnace seven times hotter than it normally would be. It's just not possible. This, this furnace is understood to probably burn between, uh, uh, at its normal 1,650 degrees Fahrenheit. You're not going to make it seven times hotter. You're not even going to double it. Okay? But the expression is, he is so angry. He's expressing this tremendous anger. And his anger is actually making him irrational. Because a hotter fire might sound like a worse punishment, but a cooler fire actually would have produced more suffering. Right? If he really wanted to torture them, he should have cooled the furnace to one-seventh of its temperature. So the furnace is hot, and the king is hotter. <laughs> and it's hot. It's supposed to be hot seven times more than it is usually heated. In other words, more than was fit, more than was proper, more than what this thing could handle. And he commands mighty men of valor to bind them and throw them into the burning, fiery furnace. Sansino, who I don't quote that much as we're in Daniel like I didn't when we were in Psalms, says that the phrase has this sense of a trained soldier. 
So the idea is the fearlessness of the three companions has this king thinking they must be like really strong. They must not be afraid. I want some really strong, trained military people to throw them into the fire. So he picks carefully, carefully picks the people on page two. He, bound, he has them bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments, and they're cast into the, into the furnace. In Daniel 3.13, the king commanded that the young Jews be brought to, to him. And the Talmud says that they did not take, points out that they did not take their regal garments off when they reported to the king. They actually showed up in all of their regal garments. Now, the Talmud doesn't make the point. Maybe they didn't have the time to take their regal garments off. The king wants to see you now. But the Talmud does just simply say, hey, they didn't take it off. And so what Rashi says, and commenting on what's in the Talmud, is from these sages, we learn that even in times of danger, a person should not change for the ruling position to which he had become accustomed. They should show up in their full normal behavior, um, and, you know, dress, and act like they are. So normally... Um, Okay, so Art, Art Scroll, which is, I'm quoting that one a lot more, actually. Art Scroll explains that this teaching shows us that when confronted with martyrdom, one should emulate the example of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and offer our lives gracefully and cheerfully. They did not put on sackcloth. They went to the king, and they went dressed in their best. Normally, Christians were stripped or criminals were stripped before their execution. It was a means of public shame. But the rust to judgment prevented them from being stripped. They are tied in their coats, their pants, their hats, all of their regal garment. They're tied other men are heating, while other men are heating the furnace. And the furnace is controlled by the bellows, which is now making it hotter and hotter. And so they're actually not thrown in naked. They're thrown in dressed. Well, all that kind of made me just address the thought, was Yeshua stripped when he was crucified. Well, yeah, and it was prophesied that he would be. Psalms 22, verses 16 and following. Dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. In Matthew 27, verse 28, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. In verse 31, they took off the robe. In verse 35, they divided his garments. And as you think about this, it really wouldn't be a surprise that he would be naked. Because in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, the eyes of Adam and Eve were both opened, and they knew that they were naked. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For as in Adam all die, and so in Christ all shall be made alive. In 1 Corinthians 15, 45, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, and the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. So Adam and Eve in the garden are naked and ashamed, and Yeshua in the garden is stripped and bears our judgment. By the way, I want to go back to this question, because as I'm going over this, and I'm showing the difference in the way the church and Judaism count, you know, come up with the date of Shavuot versus Pentecost, you know, it all comes down to where you put that Sabbath. Is it the, like this year, Passover falls, starts on a Monday night. So, but it, you know, so, so Judaism is going to say the day after that, it'll start on Tuesday night, right? But Christianity will say it starts, you have to go to, to, to the Saturday. And this difference completely breaks down if Passover falls on a Friday. Because then the next day is a Saturday. And now there's no difference between the way the Sadducees would count it and the way the Pharisees would count it. And in the years when Passover falls on a Friday, Shavuot and Passover will fall on excuse me, Shavuot and Pentecost will fall on the same day. Does that make sense? Let me just give you a couple of thoughts. I ha you, you know you, can, you see me teach all the time. I have no problem taking church tradition and saying, uh-uh. But you've got to give me scripture for that. 
I have no problem with it if you give me scripture for it. Like none at all. But if you don't give me scripture, I'm probably going to go with church tradition. Because I am a member of the Lord's church. Right? That's, that's my heart. With that in mind, the church says it's Friday. And I understand there's people who want to say Wednesday or Thursday crucifixions. But I, and I, and there's smarter people than me that will end up with saying he was crucified on a Wednesday or a Thursday. And there's also smarter people than me who will say it's a Friday. But here's my answer, my thought. I lean towards Friday. Good Friday. Why? One of the reasons is that's tradition. Second reason is what day did God make Adam and Eve? Friday. Because the first day, right, the very first day, Sunday, he said, let there be light. And then the firmament of the heavens, right? And he went through each of the days until you finally get to the sixth day, and he makes people. So if you're going to have the second Adam being made, as it were, to fix the first Adam, wouldn't it make sense that that would happen on Friday? And let me just throw something out. Just, just it's kind of it bothers people if you point if you, you know, whenever you say something theologically that people don't like, they just want to argue. Okay, but I really don't care. <laughs> you know, so if you if you like, I'll go oh, okay, whatever. <laughs> okay, but 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 let me just say the biggest argument against Friday to me is empty, completely empty. Okay, well, Jesus has to be in the grave for three days and three nights. That is, means nothing in the context of Judaism. Nothing. Nothing means absolutely nothing. Okay, that's like it's, 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 it's like ignore it. Okay, it means nothing. Any part of a day is a day. So what people want to do is they want to make it has to be long enough to get three days and three nights. If you go one minute too long, now you've gone to four days or four nights. One minute. Can you see how that could happen? One minute. If you go one minute too little, then you've given less than three days and three nights. So what you've, if you insist on the three days and three nights, you've actually said he's got to be crucified at that exact minute. Does this make sense? That whole logic, it means absolutely nothing to me. Like nothing. <laughs> okay. Any part, this is the Jewish mindset, any part of a day or night is a day and a night. It's the whole, it's the whole kit and caboodle. So I just, I just go, that's probably a Friday. It's probably a Friday. But I gave years trying to study that out. And went here, and then I went there, and I went here, and I finally went, this part of people than me that believe all of these. Why am I just going to throw church tradition out for something that people who are smart don't even agree on? It doesn't, it doesn't do me any good. And if he was crucified on Friday, and everything falls together, all the Pharisees, all the Sadducees, all the Jews, all the Christians, it all becomes a unifying thing. That means more to me than three days and three nights, which means nothing to me because it doesn't work. <laughs> Does that make sense? All right, so that's a good place to stop now that I've been naked before you. <laughs> and... Um, so we're going to pick it up next time at the top of page three. And uh, I promise you, you're going to really find, especially when we get into the apocrypha stuff on this chapter. For me, it was like, that is so cool. Anyway, you'll be blessed.